Track 1. Module 1. Listening 1. Page 12. Exercise 2. You will hear a business manager called David Thomas telling a group of university students how to make a good impression at job interviews. Listen to the introduction. How will his talk be organised? OK, well, this is the last few weeks as students for most of you. Although your thoughts will doubtless be turning to final exams, or maybe the celebrations which will follow, there's also the issue of what you're going to do next with your life, which is why I've been invited here today. After all, you've got to earn a living and pay back your student loans. My name's David Thomas, and having been on many an interview panel in my time, I'd like to talk not only about making a good impression at the interview itself, but also about preparing for the interview beforehand. Track 2. Module 1. Listening 1. Page 12. Exercise 3. Part 1. Listen and number David's main points in the order he talks about them. Notice how discourse markers, for example, OK, pauses and changes in tone of voice, show that he is moving on to the next point. Write down any discourse markers you hear. Right, well, the key to success is really all in the preparation. Firstly, make sure you dress comfortably and in an appropriate style for the job you're applying for. So nothing too trendy if you're going for a banking job, and a conservative suit probably won't help your cause if you're after a job as a cutting-edge fashion designer. And, obviously, remember to prepare everything you'll need to take the night before. Apart from your personal possessions, you'll probably need a map, your CV, photocopies of certificates, that sort of thing. Go out and buy yourself a folder to put them in. It's not too impressive when interviewees are fumbling around dropping paper all over the floor. Another important point is to go online and work out how you're going to get to the interview so that you arrive in good time with no last-minute panics. Allow a safety margin for hold-ups, and, if at all feasible, do a practice run first. Being late is a definite no-no. Related to that, of course, doing research about the company will definitely pay off. If you do this, you'll be able to ask one or two intelligent questions of your own. Finally, prepare yourself psychologically. Visualising success in advance helps. Everyone is nervous. It's about controlling the butterflies in the stomach and the dry mouth. Take deep breaths and remain calm. Track 3. Module 1. Listening 1. Page 12. Exercise 4B. Listen again and complete the tips with one to three words or check your answers. The speaker will not say the sentences in exactly the way that they appear on the page, but the words you need to write down are always in the audio script. Right, well, the key to success is really all in the preparation. Firstly, make sure you dress comfortably and in an appropriate style for the job you're applying for. So nothing too trendy if you're going for a banking job, and a conservative suit probably won't help your cause if you're after a job as a cutting-edge fashion designer. And, obviously, remember to prepare everything you'll need to take the night before. Apart from your personal possessions, you'll probably need a map, your CV, photocopies of certificates, that sort of thing. Go out and buy yourself a folder to put them in. It's not too impressive when interviewees are fumbling around dropping paper all over the floor. Another important point is to go online and work out how you're going to get to the interview so that you arrive in good time with no last-minute panics. Allow a safety margin for hold-ups and, if at all feasible, do a practice run first. Being late is a definite no-no. Related to that, of course, doing research about the company will definitely pay off. If you do this, you'll be able to ask one or two intelligent questions of your own. Finally, prepare yourself psychologically. 
Visualizing success in advance helps. Everyone is nervous. It's about controlling the butterflies in the stomach and the dry mouth. Take deep breaths and remain calm. Track 4, Module 1, Listening 1, Page 12, Exercise 5B. You will hear part of an interview in which business manager David Thomas is talking about how to make a good impression at interviews. For questions 1 to 4, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. Note, in the exam there will be eight questions. When you meet the interviewers, remember that first impressions are crucial. Research has linked the kind of handshake you give to the type of character you are. I'm not entirely convinced by this, but the same research also links eye contact to personality. And this, along with a smile, is what most interviewers will notice straight away and will help to create a favourable impact before you even sit down. When you do sit down, Sit to the back of the chair and try not to slouch. Your body language speaks volumes and shows you are confident. So relax your shoulders, hold your head high and don't fidget. And keep your hands as still as possible, using moderate gestures to show emotion and interest rather than waving your arms around. Another thing I'd urge you to do is to listen carefully. Don't interrupt and be prepared to give some thought to how you answer questions. Unless specifically asked to, avoid long-winded answers. I've had to stop people rambling on for two minutes or even longer, when actually 50 seconds at most is usually enough. The same applies to asking questions. Keep them short and to the point. When you do speak, it is obviously important to express yourself clearly, your tone of voice is just as important, if not more so. If you mumble or sound monotonous, the interviewers will just switch off and think you're not keen. So put some energy into what you're saying by varying the volume and pace. If necessary, practice beforehand with a friend and get their opinion on how you sound. Track 5, Module 1, Listening 2, Page 15, Exercise 3 you will hear a teacher called Louise Rosberg talking about the integration of migrant children into the primary school where she works. For questions 1 to 8, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Hi, my name's Louise. I'm a primary school teacher in a village and I'd like to talk to you about how we try and assimilate migrant children, children from other cultures and other language groups, into my school. When I first started teaching there, before we had our impressive high-tech buildings with their wonderfully light and airy classrooms and interactive whiteboards, all our premises looked run down. But the lessons were fun, partly because nearly all the children were born in the village and grew up there. But when families came to live here with little or no grasp of the language, none of us teachers really knew how to best integrate their children into a class full of local children. I had to go at putting up a world map and asking the newcomers to point to where they were born, then I told the class something that might appeal to them, about whatever country it was. Another teacher told me she got them to write the word hello in their language on a sticky label and put it on the wall. 
Later, the school took certain initiatives, like we would have a day where the whole school focused on a particular country, things like national festivities and typical food. On one occasion, a local TV crew interviewed the teachers about it for a news item. On another, the pupils were encouraged to put together a radio program in which they told us about their homelands. It was all to try and create an atmosphere of mutual respect. Admittedly, though, academically, we had mixed success. Subjects like numeracy and science were okay. We had lessons every day. But the migrant children made slow progress in more literacy-based classes like history, which was only taught two hours a week. And I can't pretend that some of the non-migrant students were stretched enough generally and made the progress they could have. Five years ago, the government finally recognized that disadvantaged schools needed extra resources to help migrant children. And in what I think was a really courageous move, it was left to teachers at school level to allocate funding. Normally, you would expect the government, uh, local authorities, or at least senior managers to make these decisions. Now, we take children out of mainstream teaching and teach them in small groups, of four maximum, until they've mastered the language well enough to cope alongside the others. The exception is art lessons, where all the children work together. And there's some debate about doing the same for music lessons. Some of our permanent teachers are from the students' own countries, and they come into class and help the rest of us get over difficult concepts. We also sometimes take on social workers on short-term contracts to liaise with parents if their children act badly towards teachers and other students. Happily, these days, when the migrant children go on to secondary school, they achieve as much as the other children, and even in poorer areas, they usually achieve as much as those in more affluent areas. At the moment, the government is running a pilot project that puts 15 to 16-year-olds in touch with trained instructors. This helps them fit into society and get the careers advice they need. Now you will hear part two again. Hi, my name's Louise. I'm a primary school teacher in a village, and I'd like to talk to you about how we try and assimilate migrant children, children from other cultures and other language groups, into my school. When I first started teaching there, before we had our impressive high-tech buildings with their wonderfully light and airy classrooms, and interactive whiteboards, all our premises looked run down. But the lessons were fun, partly because nearly all the children were born in the village and grew up there. But when families came to live here with little or no grasp of the language, none of us teachers really knew how to best integrate their children into a class full of local children. I had to go at putting up a world map and asking the newcomers to point to where they were born. Then I told the class something that might appeal to them, about whatever country it was. Another teacher told me she got them to write the word hello in their language on a sticky label and put it on the wall. Later, the school took certain initiatives, like we would have a day where the whole school focused on a particular country, things like national festivities and typical food. On one occasion, a local TV crew interviewed the teachers about it for a news item. On another, the pupils were encouraged to put together a radio program in which they told us about their homelands. It was all to try and create an atmosphere of mutual respect. Admittedly, though, academically, we had mixed success. Subjects like numeracy and science were okay. We had lessons every day. But the migrant children made slow progress in more literacy-based classes like history, which was only taught two hours a week. And I can't pretend that some of the non-migrant students were stretched enough generally and made the progress they could have. Five years ago, the government finally recognized that disadvantaged schools needed extra resources to help migrant children. 
And in what I think was a really courageous move, it was left to teachers at school level to allocate funding. Normally, you would expect the government, uh, local authorities, or at least senior managers to make these decisions. Now, we take children out of mainstream teaching and teach them in small groups, of four maximum, until they've mastered the language well enough to cope alongside the others. The exception is art lessons, where all the children work together. And there's some debate about doing the same for music lessons. Some of our permanent teachers are from the students' own countries, and they come into class and help the rest of us get over difficult concepts. We also sometimes take on social workers on short-term contracts to liaise with parents if their children act badly towards teachers and other students. Happily, these days, when the migrant children go on to secondary school, they achieve as much as the other children. And even in poorer areas, they usually achieve as much as those in more affluent areas. At the moment, the government is running a pilot project that puts 15 to 16-year-olds in touch with trained instructors. This helps them fit into society and get the careers advice they need. Track 6, Module 1, Speaking, Page 16, Exercise 1D. Apprehensive Directionless Disillusioned Distracted Engaged Inspired Intimidated Motivated Muddled. Overwhelmed. Passive. Pressurized. Relieved. Self conscious. Well supported. Track 7, Module 1, Speaking, Page 17, Exercise 3B. Look at the photos again. Listen to the interlocutor's instructions and answer the questions. In this part of the test, I'm going to give each of you three pictures. I'd like you to talk about two of them on your own for about a minute and also to answer a question briefly about your partner's pictures. Simon, it's your turn first. Here are your pictures. They show three different styles of learning. I'd like you to compare two of the pictures and say what the advantages of these styles of learning might be and how the learners might be feeling. All right? Track 8, Module 1, Speaking, Page 17, Exercise 3C. Listen to Simon doing the task. Which learning situations did he talk about? Do you agree with the points he made about each one? Well, the photos are similar in one way. They both show learning situations. One is a lecture, could be at a university, and the tutor looks as if he is giving his audience a whole mass of information. The other is a one-to-one -one situation. A ski instructor is showing a person, <laughs> she must be a novice, how to position her legs. I suppose that the main advantage of the lecture format might be that it is a very useful way of communicating knowledge or ideas to a large group of people, assuming they are awake and listening, whereas having an individual tutor is probably much more helpful when you are learning a skill because you get all that personal attention. In the first picture, you can't really tell whether the students are really involved or not. They seem very passive and I suspect that some of them are feeling a bit overwhelmed by the amount of data that's been thrown at them. The person learning to ski, on the other hand, looks thoroughly engaged in the lesson. I guess, though, that she must be feeling a little apprehensive. It would be only natural if it's her first time on skis. Tanya, which style of learning do you think is the most effective? Track 
Track 9, Module 1, Speaking, Page 17, Exercise 4A. Listen again to the sample answer in Exercise 3C and complete these sentences about the pictures using your own ideas or Simon's. Well, the photos are similar in one way. They both show learning situations. One is a lecture, could be at a university, and the tutor looks as if he is giving his audience a whole mass of information. The other is a one-to-one -one situation. A ski instructor is showing a person, <laughs> she must be a novice, how to position her legs. I suppose that the main advantage of the lecture format might be that it is a very useful way of communicating knowledge or ideas to a large group of people, assuming they are awake and listening, whereas having an individual tutor is probably much more helpful when you are learning a skill because you get all that personal attention. In the first picture, you can't really tell whether the students are really involved or not. They seem very passive, and I suspect that some of them are feeling a bit overwhelmed by the amount of data that's been thrown at them. The person learning to ski, on the other hand, looks thoroughly engaged in the lesson. I guess, though, that she must be feeling a little apprehensive. It would be only natural if it's her first time on skis. Tanya, which style of learning do you think is the most effective? Track 10, Module 2, Listening 1, Page 28, Exercise 2. Extract 1, Part 1 Listen to Laura talking about her boyfriend's marriage proposal. What was unusual about it? When Laura Walters met Dan Garbutt, an obsessive technophile who works for a social networking site, little did she know the implications this would have for their relationship. They're in the studio today. Welcome to you both. Laura, is it true that Dan actually proposed to you online? How did you react to that? Well, it took me quite a bit to cotton on to what was actually happening because I'd gone out for a walk with Julie, a friend who it turned out was in on the secret. Julie and I were having lunch at a restaurant, which is quite a romantic place for Dan and me as we went there on our first date. Well, in the middle of the meal, I got a text message from Dan telling me to go outside. I wondered what on earth he was doing there. I was caught totally unawares. But anyway, I went outside... And there was Dan, on one knee, waiting for me. What she didn't realise at first was that my friend Alan was lurking behind a tree and recording the proposal on video camera on his phone. The whole thing was being streamed to a website I'd set up so that our families could watch it in real time. It would have been a bit embarrassing if you turned him down, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> True, but we'd been going out for over seven years, so that wasn't really going to happen. Everyone who meets me asks if I was thrilled about the romantic proposal, but to be honest... When I realised people were retweeting the link and thousands of people were watching it live, I felt a bit awkward. Afterwards, though, once the initial shock had worn off, I was fine about it and took it as a huge compliment. I suppose you're used to Dan's technology addiction by now. <laughs> Some people would find it really annoying, I know, but I just go along with it and take it in my stride. Track 11, Module 2, Listening 1, page 28, Exercise 3A. Listen again. Choose from these adjectives to answer questions 1 to 4. When Laura Walters met Dan Garbutt, an obsessive technophile who works for a social networking site, little did she know the implications this would have for their relationship. They're in the studio today. Welcome to you both. Laura, is it true that Dan actually proposed to you online? How did you react to that? Well, it took me quite a bit to cotton on to what was actually happening because I'd gone out for a walk with Julie, a friend who it turned out was in on the secret. Julie and I were having lunch at a restaurant, which is quite a romantic place for Dan and me as we went there on our first date. Well, in the middle of the meal, I got a text message from Dan telling me to go outside. I wondered what on earth he was doing there. I was caught totally unawares. But anyway, I went outside and there was Dan on one knee waiting for me. What she didn't realise at first was that my friend Alan was lurking behind a tree and recording the proposal on video camera on his phone. 
The whole thing was being streamed to a website I'd set up so that our families could watch it in real time. It would have been a bit embarrassing if you turned him down, Laura. <laughs> True, but we'd been going out for over seven years, so that wasn't really going to happen. Everyone who meets me asks if I was thrilled about the romantic proposal, but to be honest, when I realised people were retweeting the link and thousands of people were watching it live, I felt a bit awkward. Afterwards, though, once the initial shock had worn off, I was fine about it and took it as a huge compliment. I suppose you're used to Dan's technology addiction by now. <laughs> Some people would find it really annoying, I know, but I just go along with it and take it in my stride. Track 12, Module 2, Listening 1, Page 28, Exercise 4A, Part 2. Listen to the second part of Laura's anecdote and choose the best option to complete this sentence. But you both agreed that there would be no mobile phones at the actual wedding. Was this you putting your foot down, Laura? It was. Most of the time I'm chilled with it, but sometimes I feel technology takes over far too much and I wanted the day just to be about us. So we agreed that he wouldn't video our actual marriage. But of course, he couldn't quite help himself. I'm afraid I couldn't resist sneaking two clips during the wedding. I didn't send them though. I waited until we were back at the hotel. And I wouldn't be honest if I didn't admit I was really pleased to be able to see the video straight away. So he got away with it in the end, even though he broke his promise. Track 13, Module 2, Listening 1, Page 28, Exercise 5A, Extract 2. You will hear part of an interview with a psychologist called Carolyn Adams, who is talking about her research into the impact of social networking. For questions 1 to 3, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have 70 seconds to look at part 3. Note, in the exam you will answer 6 questions. With us today on Radio 3 Live is psychologist Carolyn Adams. Carolyn, you've spent the last year investigating the impact of social networking on our lives. Is there anything there which you think is a cause for concern? Well, inevitably, some of the research was going over old ground. The usual stories about people splitting up with their partners because they were glued to the screen all the time, and how some character types are more liable than others to become obsessed. But we knew that already. What began to dawn on me, though, was that by using a smiley face or thumbs-down icon when texting or social networking, people are choosing to communicate in a very simplistic way. And what really worries me is how people are ever going to work out the subtleties of communication, expressions or tones of voice if they don't actually get to meet up that often. And was there anything you hadn't really realised before about the impact of social networking? Yes, it was while I was interviewing a young woman called Florence uh, when she was telling me about meeting her boyfriend online. Apparently, after they'd been going out for a month or so, 
he became really anxious they should make their relationship official on Facebook. I was really astounded at how much this obviously mattered to the two of them. Almost as though, if it isn't in the public domain, it isn't real. You need to prove it to everyone. And I know that there's a tendency to use social networking sites as a kind of scrapbook or a diary at the start of a new romance, but I suppose I hadn't quite realised how many people want every detail of their lives out there, shared with hundreds if not thousands of others, and expecting continuous feedback. And in general, after your experience, what do you feel about the future of social networking? Well, there are certainly all sorts of positive aspects. It's an amazing plus to be able to connect to loved ones who are far away. And it's certainly good that governments and corporations have more pressure put on them to be more accountable. As yet, though, few questions have been asked about the kinds of sensitive issues that come up in therapy. And importantly, whether the quality of our friendships has been sacrificed to quantity. Let's remember, though, that people have always created technology before figuring out how to handle it socially. That isn't done overnight, but I'm sure it'll sort itself out. Anyway, who knows what will be the next big thing in the field of technology. Now you will hear part three again. With us today on Radio 3 Live is psychologist Carolyn Adams. Carolyn, you've spent the last year investigating the impact of social networking on our lives. Is there anything there which you think is a cause for concern? Well, inevitably, some of the research was going over old ground. The usual stories about people splitting up with their partners because they were glued to the screen all the time and how some character types are more liable than others to become obsessed. But we knew that already. What began to dawn on me, though, was that by using a smiley face or thumbs-down icon when texting or social networking, people are choosing to communicate in a very simplistic way. And what really worries me is how people are ever going to work out the subtleties of communication, expressions or tones of voice if they don't actually get to meet up that often. And was there anything you hadn't really realised before about the impact of social networking? Yes, it was while I was interviewing a young woman called Florence, uh, when she was telling me about meeting her boyfriend online. Apparently, after they'd been going out for a month or so, he became really anxious they should make their relationship official on Facebook. I was really astounded at how much this obviously mattered to the two of them. Almost as though, if it isn't in the public domain, it isn't real. You need to prove it to everyone. And I know that there's a tendency to use social networking sites as a kind of scrapbook or a diary at the start of a new romance, but I suppose I hadn't quite realised how many people want every detail of their lives out there, shared with hundreds if not thousands of others, and expecting continuous feedback. And in general, after your experience, what do you feel about the future of social networking? Well, there are certainly all sorts of positive aspects. It's an amazing plus to be able to connect to loved ones who are far away. And it's certainly good that governments and corporations have more pressure put on them to be more accountable. As yet, though, few questions have been asked about the kinds of sensitive issues that come up in therapy. And importantly, whether the quality of our friendships has been sacrificed to quantity. Let's remember, though, that people have always created technology before figuring out how to handle it socially. That isn't done overnight, but I'm sure it'll sort itself out. Anyway, who knows what will be the next big thing in the field of technology. Track 14, Module 2, Listening 2, Page 31, Exercise 3. You will hear an interview with a dance teacher called Lucy Chapman, who works with young offenders, and Dylan Baker, who is one of her students. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have 70 seconds 
to look at part 3. In the studio today we have Lucy Chapman, a dance teacher who works on a radical program for young offenders, and Dylan Baker, a former young offender who was once one of her students on the program. Turning to you first, Lucy, perhaps you could tell us a bit about the project. Yes, good morning. Um, basically, it's a rigorous three-month dance course leading to a recognised qualification. It's not intended for all criminals, but for young offenders who have been arrested several times but are not considered a serious risk to the public. Mm -hmm. In our view, giving these kids a term in a juvenile jail where they'd learn tricks of the criminal trade from their peers is pointless. If we can steer them in another direction, then so much the better. Some people believe the course is a soft option, but believe me, it's demanding and disciplined. Not only do they learn to dance, but they learn about the history of dance with literacy skills woven into the timetable. Mm, interesting. Why did you decide to teach on the course? I heard about a project in Ethiopia where poor children felt a sense of achievement for the first time in their lives when they learnt to dance. Mm. They were fired with so much enthusiasm that they put on a major dance production in three weeks and two of the former street children have had rave notices everywhere. A lot of kids around here get into crime because they have no faith in themselves and don't even try to live a normal life. Their cry of can't, shan't, won't is a kind of defence. I wanted to help them come to terms with their negative feelings, break through the limitations they impose on themselves. Mm. Dylan, at 17, you are now a dance teacher on the programme. How did that happen? Well, my dad was always in and out of prison and I was getting into street crime and it would have gone on like that if they'd locked me up at 15. But instead, they sentenced me to dance. <laughs> I didn't want to do it, but it was better than the alternative. The program came as a shock. I, I didn't like the dance stuff at first. My body ached and I was exhausted. But my tutor was patient and kept saying I could do it. A few of the others dropped out and went to prison instead. They couldn't cope with the commitment. Amazingly, I passed all my exams. One thing led to another and the program director gave me the opportunity to work on the course. For the first time in my life, my family's proud of me. Mm -hmm. Lucy, is Dylan typical of the kind of young offender who goes through the programme? Yes, although he's done exceptionally well. When they arrive, they're always reluctant. They're used to living on junk food and getting up at four in the afternoon. So we start by teaching nutrition and cooking. No fast food allowed. At the same time, they exercise hard. Then, as they improve physically and their confidence grows, they realise they might be able to perform dance routines that they thought were beyond them. That's when we see things really take off. The reason we insist they put on a performance early on is to focus their minds. They don't want to make fools of themselves. Mm -hmm. And during the second half of the programme, the participants teach dance to children. This helps develop a valuable sense of responsibility. Mm. You must find the project a real challenge. Sure. At the beginning, the courts had to be persuaded that the dance training was constructive and tough, but when officials came to watch the graduation performances, they were impressed. What thrills me most is that just under 33% of trainees have re-offended. Many fewer 
than those on conventional prison sentences. Mm. We know the skills learned are transferable to other kinds of work, so we spend a lot of time helping the young people look at directions they might take afterwards. But I have to admit, the hardest part is persuading them there are opportunities for them out there. But it must be rewarding. Yes, obviously not in the financial sense. <laughs> it's not something I ever intended to do. It came up by chance, really. We do turn out some skilled performers, but that's not really the point either. What I love is seeing people who thought they had no value to society realise they might be worth something after all. I'm convinced they go out better citizens than if they'd been locked up in a cell. We've had a fair bit of publicity recently, which is nice, but journalists always focus on people like me, which is ridiculous. It's not about me. It's about people like Dylan here. Now you will hear part three again. In the studio today, we have Lucy Chapman, a dance teacher who works on a radical program for young offenders, and Dylan Baker, a former young offender who was once one of her students on the program. Turning to you first, Lucy, perhaps you could tell us a bit about the project. Yes, good morning. Um, basically, it's a rigorous three-month dance course leading to a recognised qualification. It's not intended for all criminals, but for young offenders who have been arrested several times but are not considered a serious risk to the public. Mm -hmm. In our view, giving these kids a term in a juvenile jail where they'd learn tricks of the criminal trade from their peers is pointless. If we can steer them in another direction, then so much the better. Some people believe the course is a soft option, but believe me, it's demanding and disciplined. Not only do they learn to dance, but they learn about the history of dance with literacy skills woven into the timetable. Mm, interesting. Why did you decide to teach on the course? I heard about a project in Ethiopia where poor children felt a sense of achievement for the first time in their lives when they learnt to dance. Mm. They were fired with so much enthusiasm that they put on a major dance production in three weeks and two of the former street children have had rave notices everywhere. A lot of kids around here get into crime because they have no faith in themselves and don't even try to live a normal life. Their cry of can't, shan't, won't is a kind of defence. I wanted to help them come to terms with their negative feelings, break through the limitations they impose on themselves. Mm. Dylan, at 17, you are now a dance teacher on the programme. How did that happen? Well, my dad was always in and out of prison and I was getting into street crime and it would have gone on like that if they'd locked me up at 15. But instead, they sentenced me to dance. <laughs> I didn't want to do it, but it was better than the alternative. The programme came as a shock. I, I didn't like the dance stuff at first. My body ached and I was exhausted. But my tutor was patient and kept saying I could do it. A few of the others dropped out and went to prison instead. They couldn't cope with the commitment. Amazingly, I passed all my exams. One thing led to another and the programme director gave me the opportunity to work on the course. For the first time in my life, my family was proud of me. Mm -hmm. Lucy, is Dylan typical of the kind of young offender who goes through the programme? Yes, although he's done exceptionally well. When they arrive, they're always reluctant. They're used to living on junk food and getting up at four in the afternoon. So we start by teaching nutrition and cooking, no fast food allowed. At the same time, they exercise hard. Then, as they improve physically and their confidence grows, they realise they might be able to perform dance routines that they thought were beyond them. That's when we see things really take off. The reason we insist they put on a performance early on is to focus their minds. They don't want to make fools of themselves. Mm -hmm. And during the second half of the programme, the participants teach dance to children. This helps develop a valuable sense of responsibility. Mm. You must find the project a real challenge. Sure. At the beginning, the courts had to be persuaded that the dance training was constructive and tough, but when officials came to watch the graduation performances, they were impressed. What thrills me most is that just under 33% of trainees have re-offended. 
many fewer than those on conventional prison sentences. Mm. We know the skills learnt are transferable to other kinds of work, so we spend a lot of time helping the young people look at directions they might take afterwards. But I have to admit, the hardest part is persuading them there are opportunities for them out there. But it must be rewarding. Yes, obviously not in the financial sense. <laughs> it's not something I ever intended to do. It came up by chance, really. We do turn out some skilled performers, but that's not really the point either. What I love is seeing people who thought they had no value to society realise they might be worth something after all. I'm convinced they go out better citizens than if they'd been locked up in a cell. We've had a fair bit of publicity recently, which is nice, but journalists always focus on people like me, which is ridiculous. It's not about me. It's about people like Dylan here. Track 15, Module 2, Speaking, page 32, Exercise 1b, Listen and Check, Exchange 1, Candidate A. What do you do here? I work in an office. How long have you been studying English? I've been studying English for six years. Exchange 2, Candidate B. What has been your most interesting travel experience, and why? Well, actually, it was quite recently. When I left college, I was lucky enough to be invited to stay on a ranch in the USA, and it really opened my eyes to a very different way of life. The people were so relaxed and hospitable. It was wonderful. What do you hope to be doing in five years' time? Oh, lots of things, I hope. I've met this fantastic person at work, and we're seeing a lot of each other. I'm hoping we might be married by then, although I, I don't feel quite ready for it yet. I'm also looking for a nicer flat. In five years' time, I'd like to be living somewhere a bit bigger. Track 16 Module 2. Speaking. Page 33. Exercise 3A. You will hear two students doing part one of the test. There are two parts. Listen to the first part, in which the interlocutor asks the candidates some questions. Why are Paula's answers better than Frederick's? First of all, we'd like to know a little about you. Frederick, where do you come from? I was born in France uh, 19 years ago. And you, Paula? Well, uh, you know, originally from a little village in the northwest of Italy, though I've been living in Portugal for the last 10 years. Thank you. And could you tell me how long you've both been studying English? Paula? Well, I started learning English at school when I was about eight, but I've been coming to this language school for, um, let me think, nearly four years now. And you, Frederick? I have studied English since 2009. Thank you both very much. Track 17, Module 2, Speaking, page 33, Exercise 3b. Listen to the final part, in which the interlocutor asks some more questions. Frederick, what are your earliest memories of school? Um, I was six when I started. It was a very small school, uh, and I cried on the first day because I had no friends. And you, Paula? I remember taking a doll with me and refusing to let it go. I used to keep it on my desk and I'd scream if anyone tried to move it. And what is the most exciting experience you've ever had? Uh, that's difficult to say. Mm, there have been so many. 
It might be the first time I went skiing as a child. I'd only ever skied indoors before, and it was the first time I'd seen real snow. And what about you, Frederick? I don't really know. OK. What do you hope to achieve in the future? To pass this exam, of course. Track 18, Module 3, Reading, Page 40, Exercise 2. Listen to these sounds. What are they supposed to be? What could Foley artists use to create these sounds? Sound effect A. Sound effect B. Sound effect C. Track 19, Module 3, Listening 1, page 44, Exercise 2A. Listen to a woman talking about her hobby and answer the questions. I've always been arty, but both my sisters are fantastic at painting, which put me off doing it because I knew I'd never be as good. Then I hit on the idea of making jewellery and got a real buzz out of coming up with innovative ideas and using them in my designs. I get inspiration from all over the place, uh, photos, films, even architecture. Initially, I thought I might try and make some money out of my hobby, but this isn't going to happen until I get myself better organised. To my disappointment, the actual making of the jewellery didn't get off to a brilliant start, mainly because I tried to be too clever with my designs. Now, they're not so fussy, but they still look effective, and it's been great fun experimenting. Track 20, Module 3, Listening 1, page 44, Exercise 4. Listen and complete both tasks 1 and 2. You will hear the extracts twice. You will hear the extract you heard in Exercise 2A and two more short extracts in which people are talking about their hobbies. Look at Task 1. For questions 1 to 3, choose from the list A to F what each speaker enjoys about their hobby. Now look at task 2. For questions 4 to 6, choose from the list A to F the problem each speaker has had with their hobby. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 4. Speaker 1 I've always been arty, but both my sisters are fantastic at painting, which put me off doing it because I knew I'd never be as good. Then I hit on the idea of making jewellery and got a real buzz out of coming up with innovative ideas and using them in my designs. I get inspiration from all over the place, uh, photos, films, even architecture. Initially, I thought I might try and make some money out of my hobby, but this isn't going to happen until I get myself better organised. To my disappointment, the actual making of the jewellery didn't get off to a brilliant start, mainly because I tried to be too clever with my designs. 
Now, they're not so fussy, but they still look effective, and it's been great fun experimenting. Speaker 2 I've been going to a creative writing course once a week for the past year. It's quite expensive, but I've been given a small grant towards it, which helps. None of us have ever written anything before, so we're pretty much in the same boat. A few of us get on really well and have lots of things in common, so we sometimes meet up socially, which has been an unexpected plus. Every week we have to read out what we've written in class and get feedback from the teacher and everyone else, which is a bit intimidating. I'd underestimated how hard it would be. Not so much the actual writing as coming up with something interesting to say that hasn't been said thousands of times already. <laughs> I hope it gets easier. Speaker 3 The main issue is that by the time I've got back from work and made everyone dinner, I've still got a thousand and one other little jobs I should be doing instead. I'm also often tempted to just curl up in front of the TV with my family instead of going off to my little studio in the garden. Once I'm there, though, it's worth it. I make myself a coffee and listen to music while I'm making my pots and bowls, and it's restful because this is something that can't be done in a hurry. So even if pottery takes up a lot of my evenings, it really helps me to stop stressing about what's gone on at work, and I feel so much better afterwards. Speaker 1 I've always been arty, but both my sisters are fantastic at painting, which put me off doing it because I knew I'd never be as good. Then I hit on the idea of making jewellery and got a real buzz out of coming up with innovative ideas and using them in my designs. I get inspiration from all over the place, uh, photos, films, even architecture. Initially, I thought I might try and make some money out of my hobby, but this isn't going to happen until I get myself better organised. To my disappointment, the actual making of the jewellery didn't get off to a brilliant start, mainly because I tried to be too clever with my designs. Now, they're not so fussy, but they still look effective, and it's been great fun experimenting. Speaker 2 I've been going to a creative writing course once a week for the past year. It's quite expensive, but I've been given a small grant towards it, which helps. None of us have ever written anything before, so we're pretty much in the same boat. A few of us get on really well and have lots of things in common, so we sometimes meet up socially, which has been an unexpected plus. Every week we have to read out what we've written in class and get feedback from the teacher and everyone else, which is a bit intimidating. I'd underestimated how hard it would be. Not so much the actual writing as coming up with something interesting to say that hasn't been said thousands of times already. <laughs> I hope it gets easier. Speaker 3 The main issue is that by the time I've got back from work and made everyone dinner, I've still got a thousand and one other little jobs I should be doing instead. I'm also often tempted to just curl up in front of the TV with my family instead of going off to my little studio in the garden. Once I'm there, though, it's worth it. I make myself a coffee and listen to music while I'm making my pots and bowls, and it's restful because this is something that can't be done in a hurry. So even if pottery takes up a lot of my evenings, it really helps me to stop stressing about what's gone on at work, and I feel so much better afterwards. Track 21, Module 3, Listening 2, page 47. Exercise 2B. Part 4 consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about being a fan of a famous singer. Look at task one. For questions one to five, choose from the list A to H the reason each speaker became a fan. Now look at task two. For questions six to ten, choose from the list A to H what each speaker finds most difficult about being a fan. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. 
You now have 45 seconds to look at the tasks. Speaker 1 Some people regard me as an eccentric because I've spent my whole life obsessed with one person. All the items of his I have on display, shirts, trousers and so on, are neatly framed and captioned, and I've got a collection of rare vinyl discs in the loft, all stored alphabetically. It's true that my need to put everything in order drives my partner to distraction. She asks why it all matters. But as I've told her many times, my interest goes back to when I first heard him at sixteen. His lyrics were so full of sadness. I felt I knew what he was going through and just had to collect everything he recorded. Speaker 2 I was relaxing in a hot bath when I first heard him sing. Wow, it was as though an electrical charge had gone through me. Immediately, I jumped out and started Googling his name. Within a fortnight, I joined his fan club and was attending gigs across the world. Even now, hearing him live, the hairs stand up on the back of my neck. The fan club thing is fine, but I've been using all my savings and I've had to cut back on luxuries. Luckily, I've got a very accommodating boyfriend. <laughs> he knows that my whole life has been a string of passions, whether it was a boy band or a football club. Speaker 3 I'm a hoarder more than a collector. Uh, you could do an inventory of all the clutter and never be quite certain whether I have a method. I've got the usual uh, videos, DVDs, magazine interviews, but also rarer things like autographs and weird items like locks of his hair and a soap bar he used. Priceless. I must admit, though, my daughter's become so exasperated with the way that I leave everything lying around that she says she's going to throw it all out one day. There are so many things I've come to like about him, but what first got me interested in him was a light-hearted radio interview, and I couldn't stop giggling at his turn of phrase. Speaker 4 My boyfriend and I had cuddled up on the sofa to watch some old music videos, when suddenly I saw those clear blue eyes and, oh, I was done for. And really, it went from there. At first, I started downloading photos, which was harmless. But when my boyfriend and I split up, I covered myself with tattoos of him. It felt like a symbol of my newfound freedom. But now I'm a bit older and not quite as crazy about him as I was. <laughs> the tattoos have started to fade, but it can still be a bit awkward when you're on the beach and you feel people might be staring at you. Speaker 5 He was the first to inspire me to give up my office job, get a voice coach, and develop my talent. And while I've never had that much success as a professional singer, I've always looked up to him as the person I might be. I went to his every European gig and collected everything I could from the merchandise stands. I think even now I've tracked every item of importance there is to own and can recite in date order every single he's released anywhere in the world. Maybe it's a bit bizarre, but it really gets to me when I'm told by people who don't know me that it's only a craze and I should have grown out of such a silly obsession. Now you will hear part four again. Speaker one. Some people regard me as an eccentric because I've spent my whole life obsessed with one person. All the items of his I have on display, shirts, trousers and so on, are neatly framed and captioned, and I've got a collection of rare vinyl discs in the loft, all stored alphabetically. 
It's true that my need to put everything in order drives my partner to distraction. She asks why it all matters, but as I've told her many times, my interest goes back to when I first heard him at sixteen. His lyrics were so full of sadness. I felt I knew what he was going through and just had to collect everything he recorded. Speaker 2 I was relaxing in a hot bath when I first heard him sing. Wow, it was as though an electrical charge had gone through me. Immediately, I jumped out and started Googling his name. Within a fortnight, I joined his fan club and was attending gigs across the world. Even now, hearing him live, the hairs stand up on the back of my neck. The fan club thing is fine, but I've been using all my savings and I've had to cut back on luxuries. Luckily, I've got a very accommodating boyfriend. He knows that my whole life has been a string of passions, whether it was a boy band or a football club. Speaker 3 I'm a hoarder more than a collector. Uh, you could do an inventory of all the clutter and never be quite certain whether I have a method. I've got the usual uh, videos, DVDs, magazine interviews, but also rarer things like autographs and weird items like locks of his hair and a soap bar he used. Priceless. I must admit, though, my daughter's become so exasperated with the way that I leave everything lying around that she says she's going to throw it all out one day. There are so many things I've come to like about him, but what first got me interested in him was a light-hearted radio interview and I couldn't stop giggling at his turn of phrase. Speaker 4 My boyfriend and I had cuddled up on the sofa to watch some old music videos when suddenly I saw those clear blue eyes and, oh, I was done for. And really, it went from there. At first, I started downloading photos, which was harmless, but when my boyfriend and I split up, I covered myself with tattoos of him. It felt like a symbol of my newfound freedom. But now I'm a bit older and not quite as crazy about him as I was. <laughs> the tattoos have started to fade, but it can still be a bit awkward when you're on the beach and you feel people might be staring at you. Speaker 5 He was the first to inspire me to give up my office job, get a voice coach, and develop my talent. And while I've never had that much success as a professional singer, I've always looked up to him as the person I might be. I went to his every European gig and collected everything I could from the merchandise stands. I think even now I've tracked every item of importance there is to own and can recite in date order every single he's released anywhere in the world. Maybe it's a bit bizarre, but it really gets to me when I'm told by people who don't know me that it's only a craze and I should have grown out of such a silly obsession. Track 22, Module 3, Speaking, page 49, Exercise 3b. Listen to the interlocutor's instructions for the first part of the task and answer the questions. Now I'd like you to talk about something together for about two minutes. Here are some different forms of entertainment popular with young people in many parts of the world and a question for you to discuss. First, you have some time to look at the task. Now talk to each other about why these forms of entertainment might be popular with young people in many parts of the world. Track 23, Module 3, Speaking, page 49, Exercise 3C. Listen to two people doing the task. Do you agree with their opinions? Okay, shall I start? Well, personally, I think young people are excited by forms of entertainment with lots of energy in. You mean things like clubbing mm -hmm. with all that electronic dance music. That's very much a young people thing. It's a kind of subculture. 
Yes, but not only activities where they have to take part, but things like stage musicals where someone else does the hard work and they just sit down and let it all wash over them. I guess on the whole I agree with you. Most young people I know like things which are not so serious. Mind you, it does depend on their character. I know quite a few who find all that kind of stuff a bit shallow, not very fulfilling. Mm. They'd much rather go to a good art exhibition or stay at home, chill and read a book. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. And you can't say that karaoke is spiritually uplifting, can you? It may be great fun, but that's about it. <laughs> Anyhow, they're not on our list. Let's move on, shall we? What about contemporary circles? That doesn't have much appeal, does it? Mm, perhaps not. Certainly not the old-fashioned traditional circuses, but maybe some of the more cutting-edge stuff which mixes circus with street entertainment. I know what you mean, but I'm not so sure many of my friends are that interested. I know quite a few who would prefer to disappear off to watch some stand-up comic in a dingy club. <laughs> well, actually... Is that true internationally? Stand-up seems to be more of a European thing. Mm. Tell me, what do you think about musicals on stage? A lot of my friends like them, particularly when there are so few new ones on the screen these days. When you think about it, don't they combine the traditional theatre of opera and musical theatre with a... Dance, of course. Yes, high-energy stuff. So it's not just a matter of fashion. People always come out of them smiling. Track 24, Module 3, Speaking, page 49, Exercise 3D. Now listen to the interlocutor's instructions for the second part of the task and the candidate's discussion. Do you agree with their conclusion? Thank you. Now you have a minute to decide which two of the forms of entertainment will remain most popular in the future. Uh, that's a difficult one. Uh, let's think. Um, well, we're both very positive about stage musicals, aren't we? Mm -hmm. uh, they're fun, energetic and usually light. Yes, and they've been around a long time, so there's no reason to think they're going to disappear. Yes. Clubbing and stand-up might be more a matter of fashion, and karaoke too come to that. Do you think so? There'll always be clubs, surely. Yes, but not in the sense that we understand clubbing. Couldn't you say the same about circuses? No, I don't think so. The style might change. In lots of countries, you don't see animals these days, but circuses in some form or another have been around for centuries. I, I can't see that changing. Mm, I'm not sure, but I'm happy to go along with you that some form of circus will be around long after karaoke has disappeared. Oh, so we agreed then? Yes. Let's go for stage musicals and contemporary circus. Contemporary because it will have to keep reinventing itself to remain relevant to new generations. Yes. I think I know what you are saying. So, agreed. Thank you. Track 25, Module 3, Speaking, page 49, Exercise 4A. Listen to the sample answer again and answer the questions. Okay, shall I start? Well, personally, I think young people are excited by forms of entertainment with lots of energy in. You mean things like clubbing mm -hmm. with all that electronic dance music. That's very much a young people thing. It's a kind of subculture. Yes, but not only activities where they have to take part, but things like stage musicals where someone else does the hard work and they just sit down and let it all wash over them. I guess on the whole I agree with you. Most young people I know like things which are not so serious. Mind you, it does depend on their character. I know quite a few 
who find all that kind of stuff a bit shallow, not very fulfilling. Mm. They'd much rather go to a good art exhibition or stay at home, chill and read a book. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. And you can't say that karaoke is spiritually uplifting, can you? It may be great fun, but that's about it. <laughs> Anyhow, they're not on our list. Let's move on, shall we? What about contemporary circles? That doesn't have much appeal, does it? Mm, perhaps not. Certainly not the old-fashioned traditional circuses, but maybe some of the more cutting-edge stuff which mixes circus with street entertainment. I know what you mean, but I'm not so sure many of my friends are that interested. I know quite a few who would prefer to disappear off to watch some stand-up comic in a dingy club. <laughs> well, actually... Is that true internationally? Stand-up seems to be m more of a European thing. Hmm. Tell me, what do you think about musicals on stage? A lot of my friends like them, particularly when there are so few new ones on the screen these days. When you think about it, don't they combine the traditional theater of opera and musical theater with a... Dance, of course. Yes, high-energy stuff. So it's not just a matter of fashion. People always come out of them smiling. Thank you. Now you have a minute to decide which two of the forms of entertainment will remain most popular in the future. Uh, that's a difficult one. Uh, let's think. Um, well, we're both very positive about stage musicals, aren't we? Mm -hmm. uh, they're fun, energetic and usually light. Yes, and they've been around a long time, so there's no reason to think they're going to disappear. Yes. Clubbing and stand-up might be more a matter of fashion, and karaoke too come to that. Do you think so? There'll always be clubs, surely. Yes, but not in the sense that we understand clubbing. Couldn't you say the same about circuses? No, I don't think so. The style might change. In lots of countries, you don't see animals these days, but circuses in some form or another have been around for centuries. I, I can't see that changing. Mm, I'm not sure, but I'm happy to go along with you that some form of circus will be around long after karaoke has disappeared. Oh, so we agreed then? Yes. Let's go for stage musicals and contemporary circus. Contemporary because it will have to keep reinventing itself to remain relevant to new generations. Yes. I think I know what you are saying. So, agreed. Thank you. Expert Advanced Course Book by Jan Bell and Roger Gower. Published by Pearson. Copyright Pearson Education Limited, 2014.